أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We were discussing about the rituals and the spiritual aspect of Hajj, which is a once in a lifetime opportunity that we get a call and invitation from the Master of the Universe to undertake this life journey spiritual journey to transform ourselves totally from a state of sinfulness to a state of pardon and forgiveness and purity and then gradually this purity builds up and brings us closer to the all perfect being and in order for this call of God to mature and to apply to us God gives us extra wealth and gives us the necessary health and the path restrictions are open and especially those amongst us who are spiritually alive can therefore hear the call and then respond to it and we shall start with the ziyara of the holy city of medina to declare our loyalty and our love and respect for the holy prophet and the holy progeny who guided us how to reach god in the quickest manner possible and then in order to start our Hajj uh, ritual, we proceed to the Miqat, whereby we enter into the state of Ihram by taking off the stitched dress, making the niyyah for the Umrah to Tamattu as part of the Hajj. And then we pronounce the Talbiyah and we enter into the state of Ihram. And once we are in the state of Ihram, then all the restrictions begin to apply to us the restrictions pertaining to affectionate behavior, to self-beautification, to uh, clothing, to defense and ethical uh, behaviors. So once we are in the state of Ihram and we have made this journey of almost 400 plus kilometers from the Miqat of Medina which is Masjid al-Shajara, we shall now proceed and enter the Haram and then beyond the Haram into the city of Mecca and then finally into Masjid al-Haram for the next wajib act which is the Tawaf. But before I continue a quick reminder, the purpose of the Ihram is that we are not allowed to enter into the Haram till we refrain from the restrictions of Ihram and that is to develop in us a sense of humility in front, in front of the all uh, majestic master that we obey him labbaik allahumma labbaik we obey him and him alone and the fact that we wear two pieces of unstitched clothing shows our simplicity the simplest possible dresses before we present ourselves to our lord and now that we shall enter the haram and avoid all aggressive uh, behaviors we develop a sense of non hostility and violence and finally we develop a respect for the sacrosanct and blessed areas which are the haram and the masjid al uh, haram in the haram notice that we are approaching from the north Depending on where you come into Mecca, the boundaries of the Haram differ. So from the north, the boundary of the Haram is Tan'im, Masjid Tan'im. And then depending on whether you come from the west, uh, Hudaybiyah, or from south, for example, Yemen, there is a place known as Adaat Liban. And then the uh, southeast, the border of the Haram is Arafah. So we are entering from the northern border of the Haram, which is Masjid Tan'im. In the Haram, once we are in the Haram, in addition to, to the 26 
haram restrictions of ihram some more restrictions begin to apply so number one in ihram it was haram to hunt in the haram more so it is haram to hunt so the penalty is now more severe for hunting in that particular area in the haram also it is haram to pluck grass outside haram no problem in the haram it is haram to pick up somebody else's property so, so you find somebody else's property he's lost it leave it don't touch it this is a safe area there is no uh, stealing or taking away of other people's property there is respect for property here um, punishment also is not allowed so let's say God forbid somebody has committed a crime for which there is in the Islamic Sharia court a punishment if the person enters into ihram and enters into haram the law is you cannot arrest him for the purpose of uh, executing the divine punishment of the hudud till he himself by his or her own choice they leave the boundary of the haram then you can arrest them haram is a sanctuary haram is a safe place and makruh also to to attack somebody's honor and prestige so in the haram uh, the, the riwayah says somebody came to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam Sama'a bin Mahran and he says I had lent some money to someone he borrowed it from me and then he disappeared and uh, despite me looking for him I didn't find him but one good day I saw him in the haram can I go and demand my right back from him and Imam alayhi salam says no do not frighten him or threaten him in fact don't even say salam to him because if you say salam he's going to get worried that you're going to ask him about his uh, payment respect him in the haram once he's out then you can ask for your for your rights so haram is a special area now we are not allowed to hurt animals not even hurt grass not even take somebody's property not even a criminal is supposed to be punished unless of course god forbid inside the haram he commits a crime no if he has disrespected the haram then no he has to be or she has to be arrested and we are supposed to respect in even the honor and the prestige of the believers and we are supposed to enter with especially more sense of humility and no pride so the riwayah says Imam Sadiq alayhi salam would arrive at the haram at the border of the haram he would disembark and he would take off his shoes and he would make a ghusl and with dua and crying in a state of weeping he would then enter the haram this is this is extra respect now i have reached almost the gateway of god's uh, of god's house so the lesson we are learning now is that in the haram we are supposed to respect everything everything is from god be it animals be it plants be it humans be it the honor that human beings have be it the property that humans being have anything becomes halal if allah allows it beyond the limits that he has set it is haram meat is haram unless it is facing qibla and the name of god is recited and it is slaughtered in a particular manner so we learn uh, respect to divine resources i would like to uh, invite you to think that if we are learn to respect the resources look at the problem the world is facing today there is no shortage of resources that some people should be poor in this world but there is wastage of resources by some people who are blessed more by God so look at the high standards of living according to one report the average consumer in the rich countries consumes as much energy as let's say 30 or so in, in an Asian country or 
almost 400 times more than in African country. So where is the where is the justice and where is the fairness where resources Allah has given enough to everyone? Yet some people are overusing and some people are being deprived of the basics. Haram and ihram. One very important lesson we learn. Respect that this is God's gift. And therefore don't hurt neither the plants, nor the animals, nor the humans, nor their property. Not even their prestige and honor. So in this state we enter, we enter the haram and the ihram. Then the next wajib act which is obligatory in the state of ihram for the sake of umrah is the tawaf around the house of God. So tawaf has got its own special significance. Perhaps the most important significance is that according to the riwayat, it resembles the spiritual angelic ibadah whereby the angels are making tawaf around the, the house of God in the heavens, the arsh. And therefore the human beings on the ground also should resemble the angels. So we need to remind ourselves about the significance of tawaf, number one. Number two, just like salah is an ibadah and there are preconditions for salah like tahara, so also tawaf being an ibadah, there are some preconditions, we need to know what those conditions are. And number three, now that I know the preparation and the conditions for tawaf, now I want to do the tawaf. So what are the wajib essential components of tawaf? Where do I start? How do I move? How many rounds do I make? And if there is a boundary of the limits in which I am allowed to make tawaf, what if I cross the boundary? What happens to my tawaf? And then... What if I am within the limits, but for some reason my movement has been interrupted? What happens or what should I do to the tawaf? And God forbid, just like salah is an ibadah, tawaf is an ibadah, which is to be performed in certain number of rounds. If I get doubts, what happens to my tawaf and what should I do? So significance of tawaf. Tawaf is a wajib rukni of the Hajj, meaning that if a person purposely doesn't do it, then the uh, Umrah becomes batil. In the Quran, for example, in Surah Hajj, uh, chapter 22, ayah number 27, Allah in describing the different stages of Hajj, says that, وَلْيَطَوَّفُوا بِالْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ And let the pilgrim make tawaf around this house, the Baytul Atiq, the oldest or the most ancient uh, house. It's a Rukn Wajib, meaning that even if a person did not know and therefore doesn't do the Tawaf, or he forgetfully doesn't do Tawaf, ignorantly, doesn't matter, still the Umrah Tamattu becomes Batil. And if Umrah Tamattu is bat Batil, the Ihram also becomes Batil. So this year Hajj, not possible. You'll have to come and repeat it next year. If you forget to do Tawaf for whatever reason, which is wajib, then up until the time which is possible before going to Arafah for Hajj Tamattu', before that time the Tawaf must be done whenever the person recalls. If necessary, the person has left for Arafah, he should come back. If possible, and do the tawaf in Mecca, or no, send an agent. So the individual now proceeds to the Masjid al-Haram, and his first glimpse of the Kaaba, he sees that great house. The Kaaba has been referred to in the Quran almost twenty times, so it's not an ordinary uh, place. In Surah Baqarah and in Surah Hajj, Allah refers to this house that وَطَهِّرْ بَيْتِي لِلطَّائِفِينَ Ibrahim, Ismail, you have a duty that you must cleanse and purify this house from all types of shirk 
make it a pure house of Tawheed because this is Bayti, this is my house. Allah doesn't have a body and therefore doesn't have a house physically. When any particular association is made that these are my servants, or God is proud to associate the servants to Himself, my creation. This is my soul which has been breathed unto the body. When Adam's physical structure was completed, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ All of you must make sajda, all the angels and the heavenly beings, including Iblis. When my ruh has been breathed unto this body, well, Allah doesn't have a ruh. The ruh is Allah's creation. But because it's a special, honorable creation, Allah is proud to announce that this is mine. So also this house symbolically represents some of the greatest names of God, the best way to remember God, the best way to get close to God, and the place where there is no shirk at all, this is my house. In Surah Hajj again, Ayah 27, he refers to it as the Baytul Atiq, Atiq meaning the first house built on the earth for the purpose of worshipping the only true God, and therefore also the last man on the earth alive will be worshipping in around this house. Atiq can also mean the house which is free. Not only the first house, but the free house. Free from any uh, force or free from the protection, free from disasters of flood, let's say, or free from and protected from disasters like fire. In the flood of Nuh alayhi salam, the riwayah says the, the ark of Nuh made seven rounds, the ark around the place where the Kaaba was located. So this is a special house protected in a safe sanctuary, place of true tawheed, of sincerity, of exclusivity, and of purity. So therefore when we look at the Kaaba, it is mustahab for the first time when we look at the Kaaba when we arrive in Masjid al-Haram to make a dua and this dua is there in your books of Adab al-Haramain. You ask from Allah, oh Allah forgive my sins. Kwanini, I'm entering into a pure place now. Those who are sinful or those whose sins have not been forgiven, therefore will not get their prayers answered here. So I'm asking you before I enter, and I'm admitting and I'm confessing to my sins and I'm thanking you that you helped me reach here now because this is going to be my next step to get close to you because this is your holy house and this is a refuge mathabatan lil nasi wa mubarakan wa hudan lil alameen and oh Allah here I am your, your humble slave and servant and Al-haram, haram this haram is your haram, and I've come therefore prepared. Well, Baladu, Baladuk, and the city, the city of Mecca is your special city. Well, Baytu, Baytuk, and this house is your house, O Lord. So I've come to ask for forgiveness. I ask a special mercy. I seek to obey you through the process of tawaf and to follow your commands. And finally, to reach a stage in my life where I'm totally resigned and submitted to you and happy and content and satisfied with whatever you give me or decide not to give me. That's the final result we hope to get from Tawaf. So I've come here as a beggar, as a needy, desperate person. Allahumma inni ilayka faqeer. Wa minka khaifun mustajeer. And I am fearful of your punishment. O oh Allah, Therefore, open for me the gates of your mercy and your Jannah and engage me وَاسْتَعْمِلْنِي بِطَاعَتِكَ وَمَرْضَاتِكَ and engage me in your worship and to seek your pleasure. 
So before we start the tawaf, we need to know the basics of the Kaaba. There is this eastern corner of the Kaaba where is located the heavenly stone of Hajar al Aswad. Then after the Hajar al Aswad is the, the door of the Kaaba. Opposite the door of the Kaaba is the Maqam Ibrahim. And between the Maqam Ibrahim and the door is this circumscribed area all around the Kaaba. The limit in which the tawaf should preferably be performed. And then on the next wall, there is the Rukn Iraqi. After Hajar al Aswad, the next corner is known as Rukn al Iraqi, which will be the northern uh, corner of the Kaaba. And then there is a semicircular wall with an area inside known as the Hajar Ismail. This is Hajar Aswad. This is Hajar Ismail, where Ismail and the mother are buried. And then the third corner is the Rukn Shami. And finally, the fourth corner is Rukn. This is the, the western. And then this is the southern corner, which is the Rukn Yamani, facing towards uh, Yemen. So having the orientation of the Kaaba, we can now proceed for the Tawaf. But before we start the Tawaf, just to mentally prepare you, uh, the riwayah says, "Man tawaf bil bayti, kharaja min dhunubi." If you do tawaf around the house, whether it's a wajib tawaf or a mustahab tawaf, then you shall be released from your sins. So there's a process of purification and pardoning that will take place by the tawaf. How so? My suggestion is maybe as we do the tawaf we are asking for forgiveness from major sins notice in the ihram we said that some things are haram before ihram they are also haram inside the ihram so for example affectionate behavior with a non-mahram person haram to look with lust to touch with lust and beyond so I am promising that I shall avoid these sins and I have tried to avoid them. Or a second sin you could be asking for pardon from in the process of tawaf, beautification, any act of beautification which becomes a haram cosmetic, a haram self-decoration, obtained from haram means, used for haram purposes, therefore I shall avoid and ask for forgiveness. Clothing, Again, same, no clothing which is exposure of the private parts or clothing with haram clothing, I shall ask for forgiveness. D, we said was defense, aggression, violence, hostility, hurting others, I should ask for forgiveness. E, we said was ethical, uh, lying, boasting, sh showing pride and degrading others is haram before ihram, so also in the state of uh, ihram. Um, or no, maybe the seven sins are not action sins, they are sins of the heart. So we're asking for forgiveness in tawaf, not from the act of anger and abuse, but from the feeling of anger and the habit of anger or of lustful haram passion in the heart, or of being miserly and stingy, or of being greedy excessively, or of having jealousy and envy, or pride and arrogance, or self-conceit and self-pride. Uh, These are all haram traits that can lead a person straight to Jahannam if he doesn't ask for forgiveness. Or no, maybe it's referring to the seven doors of hell. I will seek forgiveness from the seven actions. I would like to point out something uh, that I personally experienced um, before I continue with the conditions of Tawaf. Yesterday I went to the beach. 
the tide was low and so I started wading in, in the water. When the water was up till just above the ankle, you could see through the water, you could see the, uh, the sea floor. But when we went a little further, the water started rising till the knee level. We hadn't even reached the point where you could start swimming. <laughs> and there I stepped on this beautiful little creature known as a sea urchin, full of spines. And I stepped on it. And of course, this is a protective skeleton that this animal has been blessed with. So it's as if the animal is telling me, Samahani, you have entered into my haram without permission. Go away, please. So I stepped on him and all those spines went right through my foot. <laughs> 25 of them. So sir, I lost control. I had to step somewhere. So the spines are sticking out of my foot and then they broke. So there was one part of the spine inside my foot and the other part of the spines outside the foot. Terribly painful. Lakini, to me it was a lesson. You know when we commit sins, if you remember uh, when I was talking about the sins of, uh, okay I may not have spoken here, maybe somewhere else, that the hadith says that the abuse by your tongue can be sharper and more hurtful than the, than the cut of a knife. Al-lisanu ashaddu minal sinan. So sometimes we, we may do some things that hurt others, or we may do some things that hurt ourselves, but we don't realize, but let's say maybe we are, we are, we are desensitized or we are senseless, or we are paralyzed, we don't have the sense or the feeling. In the Qiyamah we are told there will be Azab which is Alim. That Alim is a result of the hurt that we do either to ourselves. You smoke and you hurt your body but you don't realize. After 30 years when you get the cough and the, and the cancer or the bronchitis, chronic bronchitis which can't be treated, that's when you realize the damage that has been done slowly, gradually over time. Tawaf, a process whereby I'm asking for my sins to be forgiven. If I don't, I've already hurt myself. But in the dunya, I'm so busy with the uh, superficial uh, activities and pleasures of the dunya, I don't realize I'm hurting myself. You notice when you, when you hurt yourself during the daytime, minor hurts, you don't feel them till nighttime. Nighttime when everything is relaxed, all the other stimuli are down, suddenly you find your body is aching and something is hurting here and there because now your mind is focusing on the body. Daytime it was too engaged and too busy. When we leave the dunya and go to the barzakh in akhirah, suddenly we are cut off from the dunya. Suddenly now the mind is and the soul is con concentrating on the body and the hurt to the soul and the hurt to the body. Sins have to be asked for pardon and forgiveness. Otherwise we suffer painful uh, punishment in the Akhirah. So we want to do this pardon seeking tawaf for example. Just like salah is an ibadah, tawaf is an ibadah. Buni al-Islamu ala khams. Islam is based on five pillars. Salah, ibadah. Zakat, ibadah. Saum, ibadah. Hajj, ibadah. Tawaf is ibadah. If it's an ibadah, I have to have tahara, just like salah. So tahara from hadath, meaning I should be in the state of wudu, or the state of ghusl if necessary. Tahara from khabath, no najasa on my body, no blood or urine or any other najis item. On my clothes or on my body. If it's an ibadah, I need to make sure that my private parts are covered for the gents, the private parts are different for the ladies, it's their whole body as should be covered by hijab. For the gents, necessary that they must be purified with the sunnah of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And of course, finally, before you start the ibadah, there's a niyyah for the tawaf. So let's look at these requirements a little, a little in detail. The first is the niyyah. So before you start the tawaf, you will make the niyyah, O oh Allah, 
in obedience to your command, I wish to perform this tawaf. But tawaf can be for different types. So uh, this tawaf is not for hajj now, this tawaf is for umrah. But umrah can be mufrada or tamattu'. So specify it is umrah of tam- tawaf of umrah of tamattu'. But it can be for yourself or for your sponsor. Specify whose tawaf are you doing. And it could be, could be a mustahab hajj or a mus- wajib hajj. Or no, an ihtiyat hajj. All of these have to be specified before you start your tawaf. Do you have to speak it out in words or can you just think about it mentally? Or no, you just should be conscious. I have left my home to go for hajj. I have left my building in Mecca to go for tawaf. So basically you know what you're going for. But it is mustahab to recite loudly. In salah, niyyah is not wajib to recite. So you don't every time you have to say, I'm praying salah for rak'ah, isha, ada, qurbatan illallah. No. You, the, the fact that you've made your intention, that's enough. But for hajj, mustahab, better to recite in words the niyyah. And then we come to the essentials of tawaf. We need to know for tawaf, where do you start from the tawaf? Uh, Sorry, I think I put those other details before. So let me just finish it here before we go ahead. Purity from hadath means that you must be sure that you have entered into the state of wudu in the tawaf area. Um, Wajib tawaf is batil if we forget to do wudu. Or no, if we did not know that our tawaf needs wudu. Or no, God forbid purposely I didn't do wudu or ghusl. Batil, just like salah. So this is an important requirement. And God forbid you may have doubts about your tahara before you start tawaf, or doubts about tahara after you finish your tawaf, or doubts about tawaf, about tahara inside tawaf. I'm skipping these details. Hopefully you should not face these problems. But there are answers to it. I will only deal with one issue about tahara of the tawaf. And that is you become uh, impure inside tawaf. So just remember this simple rule. The simple rule is, if you break your wudu, even if you're in the state of ghusl, if your wudu is broken, you just need to renew your wudu, not your ghusl. Either your wudu is broken before the fourth round, or it's broken after the fourth round. If it is broken before the fourth round, you need to repeat the whole of the tawaf. If your wudu is broken after the fourth round, you need to complete only the remaining rounds. So, if it's broken before the fourth round, come out of the area of tawaf, go to the area of wudu, renew your wudu, return and repeat the whole of the tawaf from the beginning. But if your wudu is broken in the tawaf after the fourth round, mentally mark that point where it was broken. Leave the tawaf area, go and renew your wudu, return, and from that point, or a point parallel to that point, restart your tawaf and complete it from where it was broken, fifth round, sixth round, sixth and a half round, doesn't matter. The only problem is if it's broken between half and four rounds. That means you reach Hajarul Aswad and sorry, you reach Rokin Shami. That's three and a half rounds. The third round, you complete three rounds at Hajarul Aswad. You start the fourth round from Hajarul Aswad, reach Rokin Iraqi, cross the Hijr Ismail, and you reach Rokin Shami. 
at the back door of the Kaaba, be, let's say between that point and Rukn Yamani and Hajar al Aswad, before you complete the fourth round, there if your wudu breaks, then you're supposed to do two things. Come out of the area of tawaf, go to wudu area, renew your wudu, return. Mentally you have marked that point, re- complete the tawaf, seven rounds, and then redo the whole tawaf, seven rounds, and pray your salatu tawaf. Just like salah is an ibadah which requires purity from najasa, so also tawaf is an ibadah which requires purity from najasa. Throughout hajj, from the time of ihram, till the time of taqseer, nothing requires wudu, nothing, except for tawaf. Except for tawaf, and except for salatul tawaf. You can be without wudu, but tawaf you must be in the state of wudu. But purity from najasa is necessary throughout ihram. Beginning from the miqat when you enter into ihram, till marwa when you come out of ihram with taqseer. Throughout you must be without najasa. If a drop of blood comes on your ihram, you must remove. Not only, you must remove if you're not in tawaf, but especially if you're in tawaf, it makes your tawaf batil. Not only najasa, on your body or even on your clothing. In salah, as an exception, if the amount of blood collectively or separately is less than a dirham, dirham is the roughly the area of the uh, thumb joint, if the amount of blood is less than this on your clothing, in salah it can be forgiven, not in tawaf. Even a drop of blood, therefore it's there on your clothes, it makes your tawaf batil. Obviously, if you have a wound which, God forbid, develops, somebody uh, hurts you, or you hurt yourself in the tawaf, and you start bleeding, your body is bleeding, tawaf is batil, that area, you must mark it, go out and cleanse yourself, and come back. So if you discover your najis inside the tawaf, if you can, immediately clean that blood if possible. If not possible at all for you to do so, you can't come out, you can't do anything, then as an exception, uh, you're allowed to continue. If you discover your body was najis, after tawaf, you came out of tawaf, and now you find, oh, there's some blood on my uh, body. Was it, was it during tawaf, so my tawaf is batil, I should repeat it? Or did it happen after I came out of tawaf? If you're not sure, then it's okay. Unless, no, you had a doubt. I think there is some najasa somewhere on my body or on my ihram. Before you started tawaf, there was a doubt. And you ignored it and you neglected it. Now you see it. No. For that you will have to clean and repeat the tawaf. Or no, you had najasa, not doubt. You were sure there is najasa on your dress or on your body before tawaf. But during tawaf, how you forgot. This forgetting is forgiven. If you remember after tawaf that it was najis, it's forgiven. You don't have to repeat the tawaf, but you must clean it because you're still in the state of ihram and you must clean the najasa because now you wish to do the salah of tawaf. So we discuss the uh, preconditions, the niyyah, the tahara, and the covering of the private parts. For the gents, the private parts are very clear. The difference between ihram in miqat and ihram in tawaf is this. At the time of miqat, when you enter into ihram, you must cover the whole of the body with the shoulder cloth, from the shoulder till the navel, wajib. And the loin cloth from just above the navel to below the knee, at the time you're entering into ihram. But once you're in ihram, you can take off your loin cloth, no problem. 
even at the time when you're doing tawaf, you can take off your loincloth because your private parts are not exposed now. Your tawaf is sahih. But for women it's different. Women, their full hijab is their ihram. And therefore, of course this problem can happen to gents also. God forbid they get caught up in the crowd and the rush and they are being pulled and sometimes the, the ihram comes off and your private parts are exposed. That portion of the tawaf will become batil. You need to make sure, take off your shoulder cloth and cover your your, your, your loin, for example. For women, let's say some hair comes out from their headdress. So that means their part, which is wajib to be covered, is exposed, and therefore that's haram. If it's done purposely, the tawaf is batil. According to Hazrat al Sistani, may Allah protect our maraji, if it happens even purposely, she has done something haram and sinful, but the tawaf is sahih. Marwa says no. Ihtiyat wajib, the tawaf is batil. She'll have to redo it with the proper hijab. But it's ihtiyat wajib mas'ala, so you can make ruju'. So now we want to perform the tawaf. We know the preconditions of tahara and of covering the private parts. Now we go to the essentials of the tawaf, the wajib parts of the tawaf. I want, where should I start and stop? In which direction I should move? Is there an inner limit? Is there an out, inner limit too? Is there an outer limit for the tawaf area, the number of rounds, and the continuity? These are the wajibat. So I'll explain to you one by one. So number one is start you need to start at Hajarul Aswad. So my suggestion to you is enter the Tawaf area uh, from anywhere, anywhere you can enter the Tawaf area and start walking around, but don't make a knee of Tawaf, just walk around. Walk around, just feel, get a feel of the uh, Tawaf area, the crowd, the movement facility, uh, and your convenience. And then as you are approaching Hajar al-Aswad, somewhere here, start making your niyyah. I'm going to start my tawaf of Umrah to Tamattu as part of my hajj, wajib hajj, mustahab hajj, for myself or for my sponsor. And um, for a, or a mustahab hajj or a wajib hajj or a mafid dhin mahajj qurbatan ilallah so you've made your niyyah before you reach the hajar al-aswad so you make your niyyah when I reach hajar al-aswad I will start my tawaf you make your niyyah so once you once you reach this area start walking with the niyyah you've started your tawaf and you complete the each round back at Hajar al-Aswad to make sure that you began at Hajar al-Aswad and to make sure that you finished at Hajar al-Aswad. Just like wudu, I have to wash from the elbow. To make sure I've begun from the elbow, I wash a little above the elbow so my whole elbow is covered. A step or two before Hajar al-Aswad, start your tawaf. A step or two after your Hajar al-Aswad, stop your tawaf so you're sure you've completed the rounds. This is the beginning and the end at Hajar al-Aswad. Number three, wajib to go in the right direction, which is the anti-clockwise direction. You move from Hajar al-Aswad to the door, to the Rukni Iraqi, across the Hijra Ismail. That should be the direction. And therefore, your left shoulder should be facing the Kaaba. However, left shoulder facing the Kaaba is only wajib to the point whereby your direction of movement is anti-clockwise. So, what is invalidating the tawaf is to move with the right side of your body facing the Kaaba. Or no, what breaks your tawaf is to face the Kaaba and move toward the Kaaba. 
or no, you give your back to the Kaaba and you move away from the Kaaba. This is what breaks the tawaf. The ayah in the Quran is وَلْيَطَّوَّثُوا بِالْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ You must make tawaf around, not to the house, not away from the house, not in the right direction, clockwise direction, as the Holy Prophet ﷺ did it with the left shoulder facing the Kaaba. So if you're moving with your left shoulder, if you face slightly the Kaaba, but not fully. Or if you give slightly your back, but not fully. But nevertheless, your movement is in the anti-clockwise direction. No problem, your tawaf is sahih. Your tawaf will only become invalid if you start moving to the Kaaba or moving away from the Kaaba with your back, not slightly uh, with your back turned towards the Kaaba. So that is the direction rule. Number four, the inner limit. For those who can manage to reach right near the wall of the Kaaba, it is not allowed to walk on this projection on the floor of the Kaaba. Kwanini. Sababu, this is counted as part of the wall of the Kaaba, this projection. We are supposed to do tawaf around the Kaaba, not on the wall of the Kaaba. The second inner limit is this semicircular wall. We should not do tawaf inside the semicircle. We should do it outside the semicircle. However, if we are near the wall of the Kaaba or near the wall and we're not far away, we can, we can touch the wall, no problem. That doesn't break the tawaf. Requirement number five is the outer limit. I can go as far away from the Kaaba as I want till I reach the Maqam Ibrahim. That's the outer limit. This white area designated here throughout the whole circumference will be the outer limit. Lakini, Lakini. In situations where there is excessive crowd and it's difficult to be within this limit, look at this area here, it is known as Hatim. Hatim is crushing, the crusher. You will notice if you go and observe any recording of the tawaf, or you go and watch the tawaf from the upper floor, you'll find the maximum crowd around this area. Because new, new pilgrims enter here, old pilgrims come and stop here, there's a lot of congestion here. Many people try to reach the Hajar al-Aswad. This is known as a crusher. If you can't move in this area, in tawaf, you are allowed to move outside the Maqam Ibrahim. Makruh, if you can avoid it better, but if you can't, you are afraid that you'll get excessively squeezed, get out of Maqam Ibrahim and do it outside Maqam Ibrahim. So that's the outer limit, if possible. Rule number six about the tawaf is that it must be seven rounds not more not less salah is four rak'ah not more not less or maghrib three or subah is two not more not less why seven rounds i said probably maybe we're talking about seven sins seven action sins or seven character sins or no maybe we're talking about the seven doors of hell or no maybe it's seven stages of heaven or seven actions that can lead us to heaven so after compl uh, after starting the rounds once we finish the round rule number seven says you cannot stop after round one and break your tawaf and then come back and do your second tawaf kwanini kuso tawaf is an ibadah just like salah is an ibadah you can't make qiyam ruku and say they finish first rak'ah and go and take a break, and then come back and do the second rak'ah. No, it's a one whole composite unit. Con continuity is required. And finally, uh, rule number eight is control. That means you must make the tawaf by your own voluntary decision to move. God forbid, if you're caught up in a very crowded situation, and you're literally squeezed 
from all sides, front, back, right and left. And the pressure is so high that you don't move by yourself, the crowd moves you. The crowd can pull you left, can pull you right. No, the crowd can swivel you and push you to go in towards the Kaaba. My friend, who is doing tawaf? You or the crowd? That tawaf is batil. No, that sector of the tawaf where you lost control is batil. That has to be re, uh, retraced. One new development that has taken place this year, I'm sorry I could not get the, the pictures, is that the uh, Saudi authorities are planning to expand the tawaf area. Hajj had certain bottlenecks where it, the space available could not handle huge crowds. Too many hujjaj were coming. And unfortunately, uh, the hujjaj did not have the necessary etiquette and respect for performing the rituals. Otherwise, there should be no problem. If there is respect, everybody can do it properly. But unfortunately, hujjaj are in a hurry. They don't care. They want to push. They want to reach God before you. What they don't know is when they reach God, the door will be closed. They will not, the door will not open for them. Allah says, you can't reach me by hurting somebody else. Sorry. Wait. So the bottlenecks, if you remember, many years ago, almost every year you would hear news that there has been a stampede in Mina, in the Jamara area. You know, when we come for tawaf, everybody comes for umrah at their own time. Any time in Shawwal, Zi Qa'da, Zi Hijjah, you can come for umrah. But for the first time, all, all the hujjaj must go together at the same time to Arafah. But Arafah is a huge wide plain of land, it can accommodate. After Arafah, we begin now to go into a narrow area, the Muzdalifa, and then to Mina. Mina at one time, on the day of Eid, everybody must go and stone. Too much crowd, again, because of no respect. So now the authorities have expanded the, the uh, Jamara area. They've built multiple stories so they can handle huge crowds. Next, they shifted attention to the Tawaf area. They said we need to expand the Tawaf area. The Zamzam area was closed in Tawaf area. Tawaf for those who are wheelchairs, not allowed on the ground floor, shift to the first floor or second floor. Tawaf by those people who are being disabled and being carried on those carriers, not allowed, shift away. The strip on the ground near Hajar al-Aswad, which was a crowding area, congesting area, removed. So they tried to open up the Tawaf area. Then they shifted in the next few years to the Mas'a, the Sa'i area. Sa'i area was made multiple story, two stories above the ground, one story below the ground, and now more recently they've expanded and doubled the area on the ground floor to twice the size. Now with all this huge capacity, tawaf has become a problem now. The area is limited. So now they want to expand the tawaf area on the first, second floors. That expansion is taking place now. So as a compensation, they've created a new artificial floor, uh, the new mataf floor, which is, which is between the wall of the mosque and the Kaaba, somewhere in between. But that should not be a problem. Because sababu, the fatwa of the mujtahids is, you must make tawaf around the Kaaba. If the height of the new additional floor is twelve, no, it is twenty two point seven meters above the ground, the height of the, this new floor that has been constructed, it is lower than the f roof of the Kaaba. So no problem. Even if you get a chance to do it on the new floor. We are still below the roof of the Kaaba. We are still doing tawaf around the Kaaba. No problem. So tawaf in this new development should not be a problem. 
Of course, they've made calculations that it's good if there are 12 pilgrims joining the tawaf per minute or 180 per minute is too dangerous. The optimum, they say, is 155 pilgrims to enter this new tawaf area. This is a green light which is opposite Hajar al-Aswad. Just in order to orientate you that I've reached the corner of the wall of the Kaaba which has the Hajar al-Aswad and there's a green lamp. So you can draw a mental line. And you say, when I cross this line, my tawaf is going to begin. Or a step before that, my tawaf is going to begin. I've already mentioned these, so I will not repeat. Just this last point. If my round has been disrupted, because I've been pushed, and I'm now, instead of moving with my left side towards the Kaaba, I have been forced to move to the Kaaba. Or I've been forced to walk away from the Kaaba. Or I've been forced to uh, move with my right side to the Kaaba. That sector of the tawaf becomes void. I need to redo only that sector if I can. But if the crowd is so huge, I've lost control, I literally can't go back and redo this. No problem. Cancel that round. Make a dummy round. Go all the way back to Hajar al-Aswad. When you reach Hajar al-Aswad, according to Hazrat Ayatul Sistani, you restart that broken round from Hajar al-Aswad. But all the other mujtahid say, no, you restart your broken round from the point of breakage. So it depends whose taqlid you're making. Accordingly, you make your correction, please. I've already discussed all these things, so... Finally, the issue of interruption. Am I allowed to break the tawaf? I do two rounds, and I take, uh, I take a break, and I go away. The fatwa of the mushtahs is, is that if it's a mustahab tawaf, no problem, you can break your tawaf. But if it's a wajib tawaf, you cannot break your tawaf without any genuine excuse. Unlike salah, salah I can't break. But tawaf under certain circumstances I'm allowed to break. But in such a way that I do not disrupt the continuity, the mu'alat. So it should not be more than a few minutes. Hazrat al Sistani says it is not haram, it is makru, preferable not. So question, why do you want to break your tawaf? You say, no, I, I, I've become sick, I, I can't continue, I feel like vomiting. So no, so no, no problem, stop, break your tawaf and come out. Where did you break your tawaf? Remember the rule of four. If you broke it before four, repeat the whole seven rounds. If you broke your tawaf for an essential unavoidable reason, important reason, after four, mentally mark that point, come back and complete the seven rounds from that point. So you got a problem? No, you got to call your other pilgrim, brother or sister needs help, emergency. Break your tawaf. Mark that point if it is after the fourth round. At ten, finish, come back and continue from where you broke after the fourth round. What if I want to break not for an essential reason? Um, I want to rest a few minutes. It's not essential. If it's medically necessary, you need to take rest. The doctor advises that you are a heart patient. If something develops, particular signs develop, take a rest. No, then that's an essential stop. But no, you say, I just want to feel a little more comfortable. No problem. You are allowed to, but not too long a break. A few minutes, okay. The only break for which you are allowed to stop anywhere in the tawaf, before four rounds or after four rounds, is salah. Preferably, time your tawaf in such a way that it does not overlap with the time of salah. But no, let's say you are caught in a situation that you had to start your tawaf before salah. No problem. The moment the adhan is pronounced, you are allowed to stop wherever you are. Before four or after four, doesn't matter. Mentally mark that point. Either pray your salah furada, or pray your salah jama'ah. And the moment the salah is finished, resume your tawaf from wherever you stop. 
even if it's before the fourth round, no problem. Finally, and I stop here. I don't know how many rounds I've made. Is this the third round or the fourth round? Is this the sixth round or the seventh round? Problem with doubts is all, all doubts about any number of rounds, Tawaf Batil, unlike Salah. Salah, there are three types of doubts. There are some doubts which break your Salah. For example, a doubt in the number of Raka'ah, between first Raka'ah and second Raka'ah, breaks your Salah. Or no, some doubts have to be ignored. Person is excessively doubtful. Three Salah, one after the other, Fajr and Dhuhr and Asr, keeps on getting doubts. No, this person is excessively doubtful. His rule is, ignore the doubts. Or no, there's some type of doubts in Salah where there's a remedy available. Doubt between the third rak'ah and the fourth rak'ah, for example. But tawaf, sorry. Any doubt about any number of rounds breaks the tawaf, you'll have to restart. And therefore, you have to be very careful. The only exception is mustahab tawaf. A doubt in a mustahab tawaf does not break the tawaf. All you have to do is, is a doubt between the third and the fourth. Count it as the third. Continue. And also, if you get a doubt in tawaf, wajib tawaf, after you finish seven rounds. You've come out of the tawaf area, you're proceeding to go to your salatul tawaf, or no, you're going to zamzam, or no, you're going to sa'i, and then you say, oh, was it six rounds or seven rounds? Was it seven rounds or eight rounds? Ignore the doubt, you've already finished your tawaf, you're out of the tawaf area, no problem. So, very important, we need to know how to avoid tawaf because you end up voiding and nullifying your tawaf. These are some suggested methods. Keep a counter for yourself, any type of counter to remind you the number of tawaf round. Or no, keep a minder with you, have a partner, your tawaf buddy, who will keep your count for you. But make sure he or she alone keeps the count. If you start keeping the count, we had a case where there were two buddies who went for a round. Each buddy had a different count and both were confusing each other. <laughs> or no, look for some du'as. For every round, keep a separate du'a. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا Round one. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِلْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Round number two. رَبَّنَا اِغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا وَعَافِنَا وَعَفُ عَنَّا Round three. Make your own du'as for each round. But you have to have the proper list. So you, come and you, you start doubting about which dua was for which round. No, you need to specify which dua or which dhikr. In the first round, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. In the second round, Ya Rahman. In the third round, Ya Rahim. You d designate your dhikr or your dua. Or surah, surah of the Quran. Any mustahab act, you can keep for yourself to remind. And better still, keep multiple reminders. A dhikr, and a dua, and a counter, and a minder. I hope you can't go wrong with these different systems, inshaAllah. The next wajib act is salah. I will stop here for the moment if there are any uh, questions regarding tawaf. Yes, please. Yes. That's correct. No, your niya is very clear because you wanted to complete seven rounds. And either an emergency or a non-emergency uh, development took place. Um, so your niya is still there that you want to finish the seven rounds. So you have come back with the, with the same niya. Unless you are so distracted that if somebody were to ask you, excuse me, what are you doing here? No, I, I, I just came back from wudu. Well, what are you doing here? Uh, no, but the other pilgrims are here. So you don't even know why you came here. That means you're so distracted, so forgetful, that you don't even know, you don't even have the right niya. I don't think so an individual will reach that level of stress. 
So all of us, the fact that we have gone to the masjid, we have made the knee of seven rounds. I want to finish seven, I was interrupted. I've come back to finish my seven rounds. That first knee is good enough. If if you're still uh, with your stamina, we can continue with Salat al-Tawaf, otherwise we can postpone it for tomorrow, inshallah. And we finish with Sa'i and Taqseer. And then one more session we have for uh, the Hajj al which we can move very quickly because many of the Hajj al rituals are similar to the Umrah al Let's take a break here now, inshallah. We'll continue with uh, Salat al-Tawaf tomorrow, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.